Hi everyone, my name is Sepida Soltaninia. I'm the head of the director's office and partnerships manager at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI. And I have the distinct pleasure to have this uh, flower side chat um, with Stefan Levin, the incoming chair of CIPRI's governing board and of course, former prime minister of Sweden. Stefan, welcome to the Stockholm Forum stage. Thank you very, so much, thank you. Very nice to have you here. Um, I wanted to start off by taking stock of the current state of affairs. So we have no shortages of uh, challenges facing humanity and the planet today. We have an appalling number of armed conflicts, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We have the coronavirus pandemic, the disastrous impacts of climate change. We know that these challenges are interconnected, that they cross national borders and that they require collective solutions. Um, do you think that our current system is up for the challenge? No, obviously not. Because uh, yes, I know we do have a, a lot of tools. We know that, but uh, we also lack uh, structures. The pandemic is, is a clear example. Uh, we managed. Uh, we uh, the, the 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 sector managed to develop a vaccine in just one year. So we we show that if you put in these resources, you cooperate, you can be much, much quicker than we ever thought. But after that, problems. The distribution, the logistics, we didn't have a system, uh, we didn't have a holistic view on. And I remember very much talking to, for example, um, the, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and we were both frustrated because we, we should have had a structure sitting down around the table, uh, uh, the world, how many vaccines do we need to produce? What are we gonna do with the logistics to make sure that it reaches all continents, all countries? Do we have to, to educate in some regions, some countries, more people so that you actually can get the shot? Because this is what makes the difference, not developing the vaccine. This is at the end of the day. So, so obviously we did manage that good enough. And that, I think, it shows a failure, but it also shows a good example of what we can do better. So let's use that now to make sure that next time it happens, we have this system working. Mm. So I guess you're talking about kind of global public health as one of these yeah. global public goods. Yeah. I know that you and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the former president of Liberia, are co-chairing a UN high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism. And one of the main objectives of this board is to advance ideas of the governance of global public goods. So what are the shortcomings of our current governance structures in safeguarding some of the global public goods? I'm thinking especially when it comes to the environment and peace. Mm -hmm. First, uh, it appears as if the, the, the term global public goods are a bit uh, discussed. Mm -hmm. So uh, the original name of the high level board was actually that was proposed to be about global public goods, but there were some member states that they questioned it. Mm. So it's, now it's a high-level advisory board on, on effective multilateralism. That doesn't matter because I think uh, still we need to, to widen this, uh, this, uh, uh, the meaning of global public good. health is obviously one of them, peace you have. So we, we need to make sure that more people around the world have, this, have access to, to these. So we, we will work with that anyway. Um, 
and, and as I said, you can see, you can see deficits in, in many areas. Obviously, we, we just started the work, so we're not there yet. Mm. Uh, but the, the Secretary General asked us to be, to be bold, to be concrete, so we're not, we're not going to discuss new, new what to do, new policies. That is not on the agenda. Now it's a question of how do we do it? How, how, how? We have the Paris Agreement. We have the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. We have the SDGs, so we know what to do, but we're doing it too slow, obviously in the climate issue as well. So uh, around these areas, uh, of course, then uh, uh, peace, uh, security, uh, health, uh, climate, digitalization. So we have, uh, it's, it's, it's like this. Uh, so we have to try to narrow it down and concentrate and, and do as the Secretary, Secretary General asks us to be concrete and bold. I know since before, and we all know that, for example, the, 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 in the peace and security field, we, we discussed the, the Security Council mm -hmm. uh, 25 or perhaps even 30 years ago. Now, one of my predecessors, Ingvar Carlson, worked in a similar uh, group, and they, they uh, proposed changes when it comes to the veto right. Uh, that wasn't, uh, of course, popular with the P5, um, and one can understand that, but at the same time you see now again uh, that one of the P5 can veto what needs to be done in the Security Council when it comes to, to Ukraine and the situation in Ukraine, the, the horrible attack on Ukraine. So, so something needs to be done, but we have to think this through, what is the best to do. Also on health issue, digitalization, uh, climate. Basically, I mean, we have the Paris Agreement. We, we have a, a, a structure. We have these the national determined contributions. So it shows that we have, a, we have an idea of what we need to do. Uh, decrease uh, emissions, of course, and, and get rid of CO2 emissions uh, eventually. Uh, we, and we, we understood that it's at the national level that you need to take the responsibility. Also, you cannot say this is, a, this is something global. We need to do something in Sweden and all over the world. So we have that, but we see it, it works. It's too slow. So we need to uh, find new ways of, of speeding up this space because 1.5 degree is the maximum. We must decide a very, very, uh, very determined to do that. Um, one thing that we lack, of course, and I, I, so I understand the, the developing part of the world are also very concerned that the developed, we promised already in 2009, mm. I think it was 2009 or 2008, something, to, to make sure that we could uh, come up with $100 billion. That was a promise to the developing world in order for them to, to, to be able to handle the transition. We're not there yet. So before the Glasgow, uh, the COP in Glasgow uh, last autumn, last November, uh, we were pushing for let's let's do this before the COP. Mm. It didn't happen. We had a meeting just in the beginning of the COP. Still didn't happen. Now we lack some 10, 20 billion dollars, and it's a shame, to be honest, that we haven't been able to make sure here's a hundred billion dollar to support you. I mean. $20 billion in this world. It, 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 we do not lack resources. So there's something there. It, there's a political will. We, we should have counted who contributes with what to make sure that we have this $100 billion. To show, to build trust. Because as long as we don't have that trust between the, the developing countries and developed, um, uh, we, we can't be effective enough. So you touched on this, the need for political will. So, of course, meaningful, informed change requires political will. What, if anything, gives you hope that the political will to make these lasting improvements to our current governance structures actually exists? Yeah, we need to improve it, obviously. Uh, I think what Michael Tadstrom said yesterday, uh, let, let, let the youth, uh, you, you need to, to let them speak more and, and loudly and if we speak also for the future generations. So this is something that we now occupied with also in, in this high level advisory board. Uh, during the process until we, we present the report, launch the report in January next year, we need also to include 
more people because you need to build that pressure. Um, and and um, that is one thing. So youth and civil society in a broader sense, uh, but also also to see what we can do to to make sure that uh, that countries actually take the responsibility to show the positive narrative. Climate issue is very, very interesting. I mean, we know what we must do. But I think it has been too much doom and gloom. Uh, it is not easy, so we, we cannot be naive. But we, we must build a more positive narrative that this change that we're taking on, this is a huge transition. It's, it's, it's huge, but we, we know that we must do it. And, and um, I'm not saying Sweden is, is perfect, but I think in, now we, we're, try, we're getting closer to a narrative where people actually can see, okay, this is what you're talking about. Uh, in, uh, steel had been produced the same way for a thousand years, basically, for a thousand years with coal. Now SSAB can produce steel without using coal. I have a little piece of metal home, mm -hmm. zero CO2. So, and we're, we're building huge battery factories for electric cars, supporting uh, individuals who want to buy an electric car. Uh, try to show people, people want to do the right thing. We can support them helping to do the right thing. And we can now show that here, with the steel, uh, CO2 free steel production, here are the new jobs. We're saving the climate, but also uh, making sure that we have new jobs. And where you have the new jobs, you have the future welfare. So the welfare state will be also sustainable. So then you, you have a more positive and visible uh, uh, picture of, of what needs to be done. And it's, it's out of joy. Mm -hmm. We're walking in that direction because it's a better society. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to something you mentioned about the youth and civil society, which are two traditionally excluded groups from multilateral institutions. So in the report, Our Common Agenda, which is kind of this framing report for your high-level advisory board, the UN Secretary General notes that more effective multilateralism is more networked and more inclusive multilateralism. What do you think needs to be done to make multilateral institutions truly more inclusive? And I want to know, what advice would you have for your former self and other heads of government on the responsibility that decision makers bear in ensuring that the rel all of the relevant stakeholders have a seat at the table? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I first started with myself. I should say you should have done more <laughs> faster. Uh, but seriously, um, my whole experience as a trade union uh, leader and also as a, as a politician is that the more, the more inclusiveness, the more inclusivity, the better result and result. Mm -hmm. So, and it's not, it, this is not rocket science. Uh, at least what I know best is Sweden and we have a strong civil society and it's a strong civil society out there. We have a strong civil society in Ukraine. Ukraine has very strong civil organizations, and I, my, I'm, I'm, I strongly believe that part of what they're doing now, the, 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 the fact that they can resist this so strongly is due to a strong civil society, because it connects people, and, and it creates trust in a society. So, I mean, knowing that, we, we should be able to support more uh, uh, groups to take part in our decision making. Um, when uh, talking about, tra um, sorry, European Union as an example, uh, before we every every six months we we brought in the social partners because we want to talk with them before we acted in, in the European Union. It's not so hard to do that, uh, and it's uh, you, you can you can do that in various forms. So it and it's up to each country, of course, each government, but it is necessary if we want to if we want to develop this global cooperation into strong str uh, feel uh, the people feel yes then of course you have to from the global level regional level national level local level and individuals and uh, that's not not rocket science uh, so w that is one of the themes that we will work with also in the in this uh, advisory board 
uh, how we, in a sustainable way, can make sure that uh, youth, uh, women, indigenous people, that all groups are accounted and they feel, yes, I'm on board. I, I understand what's happening and I will contribute. Mm. So uh, you served as prime minister for seven years, prime minister of Sweden, of course, um, during a time when Sweden played a very active role on the global stage, including being an elected member of the UN Security Council. So you'll, you've seen the opportunities and the challenges that multilateral institutions uh, pose uh, firsthand. And I want to know, what would you say to the skeptics who, who would say that a more effective multilateralism just isn't possible? Well, uh, obviously, if they, if they keep that position, uh, we'll end up in a, in a catastrophe. So it is, the, the, as you mentioned yourself before, it is this cooperation and the, the um, uh, stopping thinking in silos, uh, cooperate. Uh, more, of course, we, we, everything cannot be done at the global level, so we understand that. Um, but we, we need to see what is, what is the common uh, challenges, common vision, common goals. Uh, let me give you an example at the European level. <clears throat> we, I know that the Secretary General is very keen on making sure that there's also a social dimension when we develop our world. We need a new social contract. And I, I do support that because that's the way the people feel that they are also part of this, this uh, project. At the European level, we also discussed this. I, I started a discussion with, with Jean-Claude Juncker, who was then the president of the European Commission. And he understood this. He said he's a son of a steel worker. Okay. So he said, yes, we need to do this. The, uh, at the same time, we knew all this uh, about social uh, protection and everything is national decision making. We can't take these decisions in Brussels. But what we did was that we, we, we founded something called a social pillar built on three, three uh, main areas. First, the right to have a job, secure job, uh, a good job. And the third was when you cannot work, how are you going to make a living? What is a financial support? And then we developed that into to, uh, more concrete things. Now, the social pillar meant that we, we saw this as a common uh, challenge, but also a common vision that we need to improve people's lives uh, because this European Union is not for, for uh, businesses only or the finance market. This European Union is meant to be uh, a good thing for the citizens in the member states. So what we could do is to, to agree on this and then tell you in France or me in Sweden or you in Germany or Romania, you do it your way. But we, we follow the same uh, path and we will, we will review this every year. And the nations, the member states have to present what are we doing to improve the social security in Europe. Now, you cannot just take one model and, and transfer it into global, but I'm thinking you, the same principle. We need to do it because it, it's going to be so much of national, uh, national dis decisions. But we need, at the same time, there's something that is common. We're going, this is a common global project to make sure that people are, uh, are better off and can feel that they are they have a good life now and they will have a good life in 10 years and in 15 years and in 20 years. We focused a lot of our discussions so far on, of course, effective multilateralism and the high level advisory board that you're chairing. I'm watching the time and I also, of course, you're the incoming chair of CIPRI's governing board as well. Um, so I just wanted to maybe touch a little bit about kind of the discussions that you've been part of in the past two days here at the forum and your chairing of CIPRI's governing board. I mean, how do you see the, these, uh, the things you've heard here and, and your assignment um, informing the work that you're doing with the UN and your reflections on how to promote peace and development more generally? How, how do I, I, I didn't, please. So I, I'm thinking kind of the discussions you've been part of in the forum uh -huh. and your, your role as the incoming chair of CIPRI's governing board, how do you see that informing your UN assignment and, and, and oh, the discussions yeah, yeah. you're going oh, to be part of? Oh, very much because, I mean, just, just the fact that CIPRI, the, the, the report that was launched the other day, 
with the, with the connection between environment and security. Uh, this is the way we, in, in the advisory board, also uh, working more horizontal. Out of the, uh, I mean, John Lee, Eliasson is, is saying this constant, and he's so right. Get out of the silos. You can't, we can't work in silos. We need to work like this. So, so that is one of the, the main themes in our work as well. We need to be more, more holistic, more. Uh, so we know that um, uh, to develop, for example, a region, we, we need jobs, uh, of course. We, and we, we can create new jobs thinking on the environment and the climate. We know that. Uh, that's why I mentioned the, the fossil free steel. And so all this needs to be done. Uh, I'll give an, a, another example. I'm also working with, <coughs> with Kailash Satyarthi Foundation. He's devoted his, his whole, his whole grown-up life uh, combating child labor. And so we have around 160 million children exposed to child labor today. 160 million. Half of them around 80 million uh, at the African continent. Now, th this is also shame for, for mankind. And uh, we need to, to do something about it. But we can't just say do something about it. What needs to be done is jobs. Because, because if their parents have a job, the children do not have to work. Mm -hmm. So we must think job creation. You must see social security, education, of course. But you can also show uh, that if you do that, if, let's say the African continent, 80 million children from child labor to education, sitting in the school, what would that do with the society? Uh, for me, it's, it's both um, uh, a, a question of empathy, solidarity, but it's also an economic issue. Show with figures what that would mean. And I'm, I'm convinced that we will have more investments. So, but you, once again, you need to think uh, horizontal and, and not in silos. Uh, but we must start to also there, as with the climate issue, decide no forced child labor. It's, it's, they, they, we want them in the school because they're going to contribute to the society so much more. So. Um, we have a lot on the plate. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, so you've touched a, a little bit now about kind of the importance of these facts and figures of data and informing work. Of course, CIPRI as a research institute, now that you're the incoming uh, chair, is, is very much dedicated to, to um, providing authoritative data on a, on a lot of um, uh, issues related to, to peace and conflict. Of course, one of the things that CIPRI is very good at tracking is military expenditure. Uh, Margot noted earlier this week that military spending globally has reached over two trillion U.S. dollars. Yeah. Yeah. We know that under your leadership, Sweden increased its military spending significantly. And I'm wondering, now that you've left government, now that you're working on issues of peace and peace, peace building, what reflections do you have about um, increasing the increase in um, uh, Swedish military spending under your leadership? Yeah. Uh, from 2014 until, uh, if you count all the decisions that I was uh, responsible for, uh, until 2025, we increased the military expenditure by 80, 80 percent. And, and that was absolutely necessary given that what we saw in the surrounding world, not least from, from East, from, from, because Russia was building, mm. building up. So we saw what was happening, we saw the tensions. Uh, and you, you, need, you need to say to the population uh, in the country that we will protect our country, we will protect our borders, our freedom, our democracy, here and now. But at the same time, I've also asked, I think, whatever decision we took, what are we doing at the other end? Uh, what are we doing to decrease tensions, to build trust, to, to develop dialogues? because that is the only really sustainable security that we can provide. So, so that is also why we, we've been active, Sweden, in so many years. That is why we, we said we need to do our part. That is why we, we, we uh, also applied to, to become a, a, a member of the Security Council for two years, which we did, to do our part. 
and, and to, to strengthen uh, civil society uh, around the country. We had uh, for many years also, since Russia in, uh, um, invaded, uh, sorry, when they, when they, the annexation of Crimea, mm -hmm. when they did that, and they also did what they did in, in, in Eastern Ukraine, we had to be very tough on, on this is wrong, you're, you're, you're violating the European security architecture, the security order, so we had sanctions, European level. At the same time, we'll be looking for all the time, what kind of dialogue can we develop so that we can turn this into something, something better? Uh, on, on environment issues, for example, that kind of cooperation, uh, strength, also the strength and contact, people-to-people -people contact, so to start from there. But uh, that ended also when, when Russia decided, or the, the leadership decided to, to label uh, civil organizations in other countries as foreign agents. So it got, we, it got tougher and tougher. But once again, we, we, we was never ever and I think it's more important than f for many years right now in this difficult situation to, to think peace, talk peace, act for peace uh, so that we can change the narrative because now it's going in the wrong direction, that, that's obvious. This is not easy, uh, so, but we, we still have to find, uh, never give up mm. and especially not now. Uh, so uh, so that's, that, that was a balance for me also as Prime Minister. Show the people, yes, we do take care of this. We will provide the, the best security here and now. But we also must think long term. How do we change the situation so we can decrease uh, military expenditure? Because, I mean, Margot Thalsson is right. Uh, of course we can spend this money much, much better. Uh, but there's a balance there. Mm. Yeah, I think this message of never give up, especially not now, uh, is, is a very good place to end. Um, thank you so much, Stefan, for this discussion. It's been uh, very good to have the opportunity to speak to you. And yeah, welcome to the Cipri family. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm looking forward to this so much. Thank you. Thank you.